All right. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, and we're going to read uh, Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 3. I want to talk about what it means to be an heir. Uh, Something I probably should have done, but we've already started, so I won't. That is, uh, in, in the first chapter, verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us, and the literal here is in His Son, not by His Son, in His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds, who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Notice in verse 2 there that it says of Jesus that he was, it says, speaking of God, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And a lot of times when we think about subjects in the Bible, we think in terms of us as individuals. We think in terms of Christianity. And when I say Christianity, let me be specific. We think in terms of a religious group that is on the earth, those who adhere to certain doctrine, and that's what makes things valid. And I just want to begin by saying that this subject of what it means to be an heir falls in line with, I I could say everything, but let me just make sure that some bases are covered, almost everything. And that is that it comes from a reality that is outside of ourselves. And it has a meaning that is far beyond just our little lives in the earth. And it has a meaning beyond just trying to get hold of God's Word for my life and apply God's Word in my life so that I'll be a better person and I'll be a better Christian. But rather it's applying to the the reality of Christ. You can say the reality of the Son Himself. It applies directly to the reality of death and resurrection It applies to the reality of us not being more aware of our earth life than we are aware of who we are in Christ and more importantly, who Christ is to us, those of us who are in Christ. And to find this thing beyond a doctrine, you know, to really lay hold of of the Lord in ways that are just far beyond um, doctrinal teaching because the truth of, of in Christ for a lot of the world is unknown. But for those who know it, it's still like a an external thing that you think about or if somebody preaches on, you can nod to. But in how we proceed, we don't proceed as in Christ. Therefore, the common, the common thought about being an heir of God is that I've come into a big inheritance. By becoming a Christian, I'm an heir of God, and I've come into a big inheritance. It's a little bit like winning the lottery. You know? I mean, the thought is, you know, I didn't have all this stuff, and now I have all this stuff. When this scripture right here says, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Heir of all things. The one who is the heir is Christ. And in one sense, and we'll try to explain this as we go, in one sense, there is no other heir but Christ. Amen? There is no other heir but Christ. Now, you say, well, what about all the scriptures that talk about us having the inheritance? Well, we'll explain that. But the reality is 
None of that will actually be applicable. None of that will actually work in your life unless we start right. You start wrong, you usually end wrong. You start right, you have the potential of ending right. All right? Um, and so you can keep your place there, I guess. Uh, we may be back. But uh, turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 21. I want to begin to show kind of the mentality that many people have. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 21. This is a parable of Jesus in verse 33. In my Bible, they call it the parable of the householder. And uh, this, this parable is told by Jesus to the people of God. This parable is not told by Jesus unto sinners, but unto those that are meant to be, if you will, heirs, are meant to be partakers. And so verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain householder who planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to the tenant farmers and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the farmers that they might receive the fruits of it. And the farmers took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did the same unto them. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying... They will reverence my son. But when the farmers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. This parable is also told in uh, Luke 20 and uh, in uh, Mark chapter 12. In those two renditions of it. It says, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. First of all, they lost sight of the real purpose. The son, all of this stuff was meant to be for the son, to the son. Everything was the mentality that these men were supposed to be having is all that there is and all that comes forth and everything that is in relationship to what our lives are involved in is for the father and for his son. All of it goes to Him and through Him and of Him. And, and they were supposed to be totally surrounded with this, this mentality of being, you know, it's, it's perverted to some degree in Christianity, but not so in the heart of God. This, this mentality of being Christ-centered. Christ-centered. Instead of being busy instead of having a ministry instead of just bringing forth fruit the purpose began to change at first it was to bring forth the fruit of the property of the plants of everything that he planted remember they didn't plant anything he came there he did all the work and he just join them to it. Their goal was in conjunction with what He's given that can bring forth fruit, they were to deliver that fruit to God. The purpose changed at a certain juncture where they started thinking about themselves and they wanted to become the inheritors. Isn't that interesting? Let us kill Him and we'll get the inheritance. And so... Um, there, is that, there, there is that thought in Christianity, when you put to death the heir, then we gain the inheritance. <laughs> Maybe never applied this, uh, <laughs> this parable to you or me. You know, I'm going to believe in the death of Jesus so that I can get the inheritance. Anybody see something wrong with that? I'm going to, I, you know, Jesus is going to die so that I can become the inheritor. But you see, that comes 
when the farmers, when the tenants, when the servants lose sight that the Son in the heart of the Father is the heir of all things. The Son is the heir of all things. When you lose sight of that, then you start seeing the Father's stuff. And you start wanting it for you instead of for the heir. You understand the process? And so that, that you might even embrace a concept uh, joyfully that the death of the heir will make me rich. The death of the heir will give me stuff. The death of the heir. And so let us join together. Notice there was a bunch of them and that's kind of what they did. So they said among themselves, I got an idea. If we put him to death, we get the stuff. And a whole lot of Christianity thinks exactly that same way. If we will embrace the death of Christ, we'll get the stuff. Okay? Alright, so, just to make this absolutely plain and clear, we are not the heirs. And I'll tell you another thing. We are the enemies of God. We're the enemies of God if we're not out from the air. And I'll explain that. And you, you know what that means, but I'll explain it further as we go. If you're not out from the air, you're an enemy of God. You might be a Christian. You might go to church. Do you believe it's possible? You might even listen to the message of the cross and be an enemy of the cross. Is that possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think everybody that has gone this way had to find that out for themselves. They had to come to a crashing down that, that told them, you know what, I believe all this stuff, but in, in my ways, I am an enemy of the cross. Now that, that may seem like defeat. That may seem like failure. That may seem like a horrible place to come to. But in truth... It makes you appreciate the air once you begin to see the way. Once you begin to see the truth. Once you begin to see the life. When you begin to see those things as a person, then you are glad for what you saw. It's, it is terrible to love God with all the heart that you have, all the strength that you can muster, all the soul that you can have, and yet fail Him and realize, and, and can I say it like this, and realize not just I'm a failure, but realize, oh my God, I'm not the heir. Now, things are starting to go for the better instead of for the worse. Back in Hebrews, just to, just to, read it again and then show you one particular thing here. Verse 1 talks about God at sundry times and times past, but hath now spoken in Son. Verse 2 says, but hath now spoken in Son. Okay? This is a change. This change is the resurrection. This Son is not Jesus of Nazareth that walked the earth as an individual. When it says God speaks in Son, when it says all things are given to the heir, it's not talking about the individual Jesus. It's talking about the resurrected new man Jesus. Well, that's different, isn't it? Because all of a sudden now we are included... But it's not like Jesus is standing there and there's a whole bunch of us gathered around Him and because we chose the doctrine or we chose to follow Him, you know, and I'll just say this, the, the disciples, discipleship was one thing, folks, before the resurrection and another thing after. Before the resurrection, everybody was outside of Him, following Him, trying to learn his teaching and his ways. After the resurrection, learning of him is learning of you. Isn't that right? 
When you see Jesus, you're changed into that same image because that's who you are. You're one with Him in resurrection. Everything is different after the resurrection. And everything about you is different. And all thoughts of you pre-cross, pre-resurrection have been put away by God. You are no longer who you were. And you might have come to God as an individual. And you might have come to God as a bad person. You might have come to God as somebody that needs salvation. You might have come to God as somebody that, was, that was, uh, uh, had a past. But once you've come to Jesus in the true manner of what the New Testament declares, once you've come to Him in that manner, you are no longer the same person. All things are new if, if, if any man's in Christ. But only there, because that's where you are. So when it speaks of this one being the heir, it's speaking of you, but not you directly. It is speaking of you, but not you independently. It is speaking of you, but not you a lottery winner. You know, I lived in a mobile home. I lived, I was trailer trash, and I won the lottery. You know, and now I got a big house. Trust me, that, that hadn't changed who you really are. I didn't, I didn't say that the way I could have said that, but nonetheless, that didn't, you know, you're just that with money. It is the truth. You know, money doesn't, doesn't change those kind of things, nor does the inheritance as we understand, as many, let me just say it, as many understand it. But the inheritance as God understands it changes everything because you've been joined as one with the inheritor. You are now bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You are now his body. So the risen son that is heir of all things is a many-membered body. And we're those members. That's who we are. That's our identity. So... Um, Turn with me to Galatians. And I'm, we're going to be jumping to a lot of scriptures because I want to try to show you this across the board. Book of Galatians, chapter 3. Verse 29. Galatians 3, 29. And if you be Christ... Then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed. All right, keep, uh, you don't have to keep your place there, but turn with me to John real quick, John 13, because I want to link what I just shared in that scripture with something that Jesus says to Peter in John chapter 13, John 13, verse 8. In fact, we ought to read verse 7 so that we can see how this does apply to us. Verse 7 particularly. Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. A lot of times Jesus is doing stuff in our life and we don't know what he's doing. And we're reacting to what he's doing according to what we think he's doing instead of because we don't know yet. Does that make sense? I mean, we're, we're still living off of a plane. I, I was uh, thinking about this today. Um, uh, at the conference, we had several different speakers that spoke. We had a lot of different speakers. And, and uh, there was one, there was actually two different speakers that really had at a certain juncture an agenda that they wanted to say. And it was an agenda that wasn't necessarily the Lord or not the Lord, but it was certainly their view and their slant. And they were bringing that view and bringing that slant. Two different speakers. And while I listened to it, I went, well, la, 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 okay, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I've talked with people since then one about one of the speakers and somebody from Arizona said, man, that was so powerful, that impacted my life, da 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 da, da. And everything they shared had nothing to do with the agenda the man was sharing. Had they known the agenda, they wouldn't have gotten anything. See, and we know too much about ourselves. We know too much about our speakers. We know, you know what I mean? We're too, you know... And then somebody else said something about the other speaker. The same thing because they had no clue what they were really saying. They got the Lord. You know. 
Jesus said to Peter in verse, uh, verse 8, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. J Jesus answered him, I wash thee not. What is it? If I wash thee not. Sorry, my, my own notes get so big in here I can't even read it in the Bible. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. All right, and remember in Galatians it says, If you be Christ's, now, has anybody ever read that and kind of thought, now that's a funny way of putting that. If you be Christ, that means if you're his possession, if you have part with him, the goal of this thing is not to have part of his inheritance, but to have part with him. And this is a key, folks. This is a major key in the scriptures because you never get anything outside of him. You don't. You'll never let, truly lay hold of it. It's like a carrot held in front of a donkey where he's always moving forward trying to get it, trying to reach it, and he never gets it. And some of you have experienced that in your own lives where you are after the Lord, but, you're, but in truth, you're not fully after the Lord. You're after what the Lord can give you, whether it be inheritance or freedom or, or, or help or comfort or whatever it is, you're after it outside of the Lord. When He's wanting you to have part with Him. Can you hear the Spirit behind that? That's a, there's a real tender Spirit behind that. And of course, I mean, now imagine if there really was a tender Spirit behind that, that I want you to have part with me, and all you hear from Peter is, well, you ain't washing my feet, dude. You know, you see what I mean? One guy is into cleansing and the other one's into being part with him. And we've got to leave off all the subjects and find the Lord. And that's the only way that you ever really find the inheritance part is, is through that. Um, the promises go, and you know this, Galatians 3.16 says, Now unto Abraham and his seed the promises were made. He saith not unto seeds as of many but as unto one, unto thy seed, which is Christ. Galatians 3.16 The promises are to Abraham and to his seed. Now, the seed means the seed and all who are in him. Okay? Because, for example... If I had one wheat seed right here in my hand, one wheat seed, and there were no other wheat seeds left on the planet, some disease had gone through and destroyed all wheat and all wheat seeds, and I had the final remaining seed, all the hope of, of the future harvest and of all the billions of seed that would one day come forth, that's not prophecy, that's not hope, that's reality. If that seed that I have, the only one left, goes into the ground and dies, you're going to see thousands and thousands, eventually millions of seeds, if you will. And yet, it's really only one seed. It's only one. And that's the promise was to Abraham and to his seed. He was the man that was the vessel. The seed is the one that's going to come out of the vessel. The seed is as the stars of the heaven. The seed is as the sands of the sea. That refers to two things. One is, not just numbers, let me say first, that, that pertains to His fullness. Because there's not, you know, as many as the stars of the heaven or sands of the sea. You go try to count all the sands of the sea and see if there's even been that many people alive on the planet at this time. You know what I'm saying? You find one beach. Not all the beaches in all the world. You find one beach. What is it speaking of then? It's speaking of His fullness. But there is an application to numbers in the sense that this is referring to the fact that we, we are coming out from Him. We are out from Him. But it's still the same seed. It's still the same kind. And that's the key is He wanted something after His kind. He didn't just want Christians. He didn't want adherence. He didn't want obedience alone. He wanted seed after his kind. So, 
The seed is referring not just to one, but to many. Now, a scripture you're real familiar with is Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Notice that it says, We are heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Now, usually, the way we translate this is, We are co-heirs. We're not co-heirs. We're not. We are not co-heirs. There's no way. It's, it's not like a joint bank account. It's not like he had a bank account that was not a joint bank account, but he made us a signee. You know, he made a, he, he, he brought us into that, and we can dip into that bank account as a joint heir. It's not like that at all. It's nothing like that. Um, there's not a co-mingling together, you know. Well, and, and there are, you know, I, there are people who get upset with me for saying this specifically, but there is a term, co-mingling, that's used in groups uh, that teach similar to what we teach. And it, they talk about a co-mingling. Folks, the cross did away with all co-mingling. Okay? The cross totally did away with any thought of mingling us with Jesus and I'm a co-heir with Him and we're, we have a joint bank account and isn't it cozy and isn't it all wonderful how me and Jesus got a groovy thing going? You know? No. Me and Jesus don't have anything going. Jesus has something going. And the sooner I figure that out, the better off I'm going to be. Amen? So, the truth is, there's the, the death and the resurrection. There's the cross and then there's life. We are the dead. He is the resurrection. The sooner we begin to think in terms of that, the better off we're going to be. We are the dead. He is the resurrection. Okay? That's the way you should... You ought to just get off any thought of future being raised or whatever. The hope of anything rests in the spiritual reality of this thing. If we don't have the spiritual reality, I don't believe that we have any right to believe for a manifestation or in any form of a spiritual reality. The spiritual reality is the heart and soul of the truth. You know, the example is, you know, somebody said to me once, I've shared this with you before, he came to me and said, well... You know, praise God, I, I just wonder when my ship's going to come in. And I said, did you send one out? You know. Why, what do you, why are you waiting for your ship to come in when you never sent nothing out? You have a hopeless situation here. Because you're trusting in something that's not real. In Christ, through the cross and through the resurrection, that's as real as it gets. And anything else would just be a manifestation of that truth. Well, on whatever level that happens, it is a manifestation of that reality. So we are, when it says joint heirs, you ought to automatically think joined heirs. Okay? That's what you should think. You should think joined heirs. Heirs. I am joined to him. All right? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We'll just stop right there. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. This is clearly showing that we are a joined heir. In whom? Not by whom, but in whom. As long as we are joined in Him. And, and let me say this. Any thought of being in Christ, any doctrine that you hold, of being in Christ 
should include the reality of joinedness. All right, let me, let me help you. If, uh, if I have a picnic table out there and you help me bring it in and we set that picnic table in the room, Okay. My question to you is, is it in the room? Okay. But is it still the picnic table it was out there? <laughs> it's ex exactly the same picnic table, it's just in a different location. Now listen to me carefully. This is most people's comprehension of what it means to be in Christ. They've simply changed location, but they're the same dried up, weather beaten, dumped on, picnic table that they were outside. Okay? Now, let's give a, a more accurate picture because when we say these things, and we say these things a lot around here, we talk about in Christ a lot, we must understand we can't just be registering the thoughts that we have. We must register God's thoughts. Take a, take a branch and cut it out of an old bad tree that's got worms and tree rod and everything else in it and you take it out and you cut it out and you put it into a good tree. A tree that has strong roots. A tree that has consistently in itself brought forth good fruit, grafted in and all of a sudden what happens? It is radically different because it is in. Am I right or wrong? Radically different. Now, there's, there's, well, I'll say it like this. There's a part that is not different and there's a part that is very different. Okay? Let's start with the part that's not different. The external shell, the straw, the branch, the vehicle, is basically the same. Your personality, your body is the same. When, you, when He sent you to the cross, He didn't kill your body or your personality. Amen? That's a vehicle. Your personality is not meant to be stronger than the nature of Christ. Can I get an amen from somebody? <laughs> Now, I didn't say that it wasn't. I just said it's not meant to be. <laughs> you know. Your personality actually is meant to be the vehicle of the nature of Christ. That means that you can still be you, but you don't have the tendencies of the old nature. Now we're talking about, about the real change. The real change is inward. The real change is that we are, when we're in Christ... We are drawing from His life because we are what? Joined heirs. We are taking in, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a few minutes, a little more clearly. But as joined heirs, we are inheriting. Does that begin to change anybody's concept of being what it means to be an heir. If you are a joined heir, you are beginning to inherit eternal life. You are becoming an heir of life. It says that. Both of those terms are in the scriptures and it, and it refers to that. Before I fully get into that, let's go to one more scripture since we're here in Ephesians. Ephesians um, 3, 6. Before we read it, let me ask you this question. How many in here are Gentiles? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Now, I happen to notice a few people didn't raise their hand that I'm absolutely sure that they... <laughs> a 
Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. All right. Again, we are joined in Christ. Make, make this clear in your mind. We are not joined with Christ. I'm telling you, this will make the difference in laying hold of things that, that relate to you from the Word of God. You're not joined with Christ. You're joined in Christ. The disciples before the cross were joined with Christ. They left their nets and followed Him. You left your life and He lives in you. Amen? I'm telling you, it's a vast difference. And a true revelation, not just the hearing of this, a true revelation of this will revolutionize your life. Because true revelation, the true revelation of Christ revolutionizes everything. It totally changes it all. All right, so we're not just joined with him so we can get his stuff. And all thoughts of getting his stuff is like these tenant farmers who are, who are after his stuff. And they believe that through his death they can get it. Okay? It's pitiful, but it's the absolute truth. Here it says that we are fellow heirs. Okay, now how do, how do we translate that? How do we interpret that? Well, usually the way we interpret that is this. Uh, I am a fellow, and I'm a fellow heir. And we're all just good fellows, being heirs together with Jesus. However, we can't, and, and if uh, no hands or anything like that, but has anybody ever read that, that we are fellow heirs, and kind of thought, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a fellow heir in the sense that I just described. But the definition is in this scripture. And the definition of it says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, number one, same body, number two, partakers of his promise in Christ. You do not partake of the promises outside of Christ. You are made of the same body and therefore all things are yours. But if you're not one with him, and we'll, we'll see this as we go, just because you prayed a salvation prayer doesn't make that immediate in your life. Okay? The proof of that is just look around Christianity. How many people do you know have truly have abundant life? And I'm not talking about driving Cadillacs and living in big houses. You know, well, that's a, you know, a lot of people, that's the translation. That's abundant life. I have, I have the abundant life. And that's really, literally, I've heard that preached before. The abundant life I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so you'll have more. What that means is you'll have more things and he'll give you more things and they're his things anyway, so you're going to get them. You know. All right. So. I'm wondering how I should gauge this. If maybe this wouldn't be a good place to stop. Let me just ask anyone if you have a question on anything I've shared just to make sure or a comment. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, I, I don't want to really get into too much and, and uh, override what the Lord's trying to say. And that is, basically, we're going to have to leave all the concepts, and not just in relationship to being an heir, we're going to have to leave all of the concepts in relationship to um, who we are outside of Christ. We have to. We have to quit thinking that God's giving us stuff, whether it's patience or love or anything. These are fruit of the Spirit that flow out. First of all, see, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but I just, I'll just lay the groundwork for it. Fruit, if you're a branch, fruit doesn't come from fruit. Fruit comes from life within. Amen? And the life within will produce the fruit. 
So it's ridiculous. And, and, and the life within is a result of believing into Christ. And that's really, that is, when you see when it says to believe Christ or, or believe in Him, like it, when it says to believe in Him, it literally is saying to believe into Him. In other words, and it, I'm, I'm just reiterating the same concept over and over again. In other words, one is that He's over there and I'm over here and I am believing Him. I believe in Christ. And many people, if, you, if, you, if someone came up to you on the street, and I'm trying to radically change your thinking. So if somebody came up to you on the street and said, do you believe in Christ? Would your mind kind of drift up, way up above and say, yes, I, I believe in Christ. You know what I mean? Or would it kind of drift to the Christianity and the ministry and go, yes, I believe in Christ. When in reality, it is a believing into Him it is a believing into union with Him. It is a believing not that anything that you have, and, and the truth is, and I won't have time to get into all this, but the truth is, you are an heir of the promise strictly by faith. And Galatians spends a lot of time really laying into that reality. That these things are by faith. And the faith, folks, isn't faith that there is a God, or faith that there's a Jesus, or faith that there was a Jesus that came and did something, or faith that there's, there's a Jesus that works in the ministry among us. It is a faith in that Son in whom we are. It is a faith that we are now in Christ. Because any other faith attaches you, or, or, or how shall I say this, acquaints you put you in proximity to Him without being in Him, which is prior to the cross and, and prior to the resurrection. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, this is, this is beliefs in Jesus without the, resur without the death and resurrection. And the scriptures clearly say that, that you know, that's not going to save you. Jesus of Nazareth never saved anybody in the sense of what I'm talking about right now. Jesus of Nazareth could heal you and you were still you. He could cast a demon out of you and if you're, you know, the way you are right now, they'd come back seven times worse. You know, he can do all of this stuff for you. And Jesus walked and he healed and he ministered and he fed and he put food in people and he did all of this stuff. And at a certain juncture, he changed his mode. He changed his way of relating. And it's marked in John 12, 24, where there is a, you could, you could take a sword, cut it right down there. The book of the gospel of John from that point up to that point right there, John 12, 24, all of a sudden, Jesus doesn't do, He does one more miracle after that, and that was only because Peter cut the guy's ear off and he stuck it back on. But after that, Jesus doesn't do any more miracles. After that time, Jesus is running and hiding. He's not seeking followers. And, and the words that mark the difference is John 12, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it'll bring forth fruit. Do you comprehend what he meant when he said that? He's saying, I haven't brought forth any fruit yet. I've got to die to bring forth fruit. Everything around me is after another kind, even if it receives my, let me say it like this, my inheritance. Even if I give them my stuff. Here, oh, well here, here's this, and here's this, and here's that. There's still a different seed. He's still abiding alone. The only seed of God, the only one that is after this nature and after this kind. So he says, this is fruitless. Okay. Now what I just described as fruitless 
is what 90% of ministry describes as much fruit. <laughs> more healing, more blessings, more giving, more food, more this, more that. That's, that's the fruit that they describe. And Jesus is saying, I've done all of that and nobody's different. There's only one way to bring a difference. And that is, I've got to die and bring forth my life in others. All right. Here's the key to that. In His death, we died. Not by His death. In His death, we die. In His resurrection, we are joined we are joint heirs. Heirs of His life. Heirs by union from, out from Him where His life flows and now that's how the fruit comes. Not by a disciple standing out here and trying to copy Jesus. Not trying to be a good Christian. And I'm, why do I say these things the way that I'm saying them? Because some of you struggle you love God and you struggle and you go through pain and agony and much of your agony is, is fruitless. You worry about yourself. You, you, you look at yourself as an independent little poor little grain on this earth in a great big universe and you go, how will I ever measure up? How will I ever count for anything? How will I... Your thoughts are outside of Him. You're not believing into Him. You're believing about Him. And believing about Him will never bring forth fruit. Abiding in brings forth fruit. So, this I'll try to wrap this up now. So, if we don't have a radical, for, for, I mean, you know, I'm talking about inheritance, but if we don't have a radical change, this affects everything. This affects everything. And if you're sitting here as one who does believe this, then join with me in spirit that we can take this gospel to the ends of the earth because people all over the world need to hear this and this is not what they're hearing. And even those who come to God are being told God will give stuff to you. And they are, they are taking them out of Christ and they're taking them back through the cross and they're taking them out of the death with Jesus and they're putting them in on the shores of Galilee with Jesus and they're teaching them a relationship that is not. And we wonder, I mean, we wonder why the mass has grown. We wonder why there's problems. And I'll, I'll, I'll just add this. And if you don't know this, if you've grown and you have problems, then I tell you in the name of Jesus, get hold of the truth because we don't have time to be messing with you. You need to get up and join with us. We've got, I mean, there's not many of the, Jesus said, pray for laborers. For God's sake, pray for laborers. People need to hear. People need to change their relationship. It's a shame we can't talk, start with a blank slate and just write the truth on their heart. We've got to undo some stuff. And much of what I'm teaching right now it's really just undoing. It's undoing thought patterns. It's undoing uh, uh, an image of ourself that is not true since the resurrection. It's not who you are. The inheritance is yours. The inheritance is yours, but only by being one in Him. All right. Well, I think we'll just stop right there. And uh, when we come back, I want to get into this thing a little more of the inheritance in relationship to the true vine. I want to, I want to emphasize this fruitfulness 
that comes by join, joinedness instead of a change of location from one place to another and then just believe in somehow magically thinking thinking that magically if I have changed locations and am now in Christ that everything's going to work out for me. It's not. You must believe into it. Yes. All right. Well, we'll break and come back.